On today's show, we will look at some under-the-radar players the Mets could still target in free agency. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you uh, amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers who join today will get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Is a fanduel.com slash locked on to get started. Now, the Mets could be done adding in free agency. The big you know, part of their team that had to be addressed was the bullpen. They've done that. They've added Adam Adovino, Jake Diekman, and Shintaro Fujinami. They're set there. The starting rotation was the part of their team they attacked most early in the offseason. Luis Severino, Sean Manaya, and trading for Adrian Hauser. They've added Harrison Bader and Tyrone Taylor in the outfield. They added Joey Wendell in the infield. This team could very well be done, but there's also still time until spring training starts. And I don't think that David Stearns and his team are just going to sit around and do nothing with free agents still out there. I imagine dialogue will still be had. Players will be checked in on. So what I wanted to do today is look at some under the radar targets. The Mets could still go after in free agency. So we're not talking about Jorge Soler and JD Martinez, even though those are the two players that Mets fans are still probably the most focused on. This is about finding some other players that could fill the Mets' needs. Now, the three areas I could see them go after is what we're going to be talking about today. There's DH, there's DH slash an outfielder to put into the mix, and then there's DH slash third baseman to put into the mix, or just another insurance policy or insurance option, I should say, for Brett Beatty at third. So those are the areas. We'll start with DH. If the Mets aren't going to attack the top of the market, there's a middle ground that they could go to for a guy that would absolutely help the Mets win in 2024. That's Brandon Belt. He turns 36 years old in April. He's missed time in each of the last three years, but last season he was relatively healthy, getting on the field for over 100 games. He did have a hamstring injury that knocked him up a bit in June, and then he had some back issues in September. But overall, he was out there for the Blue Jays. He hit 254, got on base at a 369 clip, slugged at a 490 clip, had 19 home runs and a 138 WRC plus. Again, WRC plus measures hitters based on a league average of 100. His 138 WRC plus means he was 38% better than your league average hitter. Brandon Belt would complement this roster well. He'd essentially relegate DJ Stewart, is how I think that that would ultimately break down because Brandon Belt does not hit lefties. Last year, he only got 39 plate appearances against lefties, which is basically just you started the game as the DH when a right-hander was on the mound and a lefty came out of the bullpen and they didn't pinch hit for you. Like that's, you know, probably a large portion of those plate appearances. I don't think he was in the starting line at first a lefty very often to only have 39 plate appearances in a hundred plus games. Okay. So that's something he doesn't do. That makes him a compliment with Mark Fientos at DH. He wouldn't compliment DJ Stewart at DH. So, you still have an option on Stewart. Brandon Bell does get hurt, as I've mentioned. So it wouldn't be saying, hey, DJ is not going to be seen at all this year. It's just he's not going to be seen on opening day. And it would also be putting Mark Vientos in a position where he'd have to hit his way into playing time. And it would put you know more of a competition at third base between Vientos and Beatty instead of sort of giving them both an open runway to start at third base and DH. I would like this signing a lot, but I'd also have my concerns. The part that I like, 19 home runs last year. In 2021, he had a big season, had 29 home runs in 97 games, had a 159 WRC+. 2022 was a down year for him, but he had, I mean, ailing back issues, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember that correctly. He just had a season in 2022 where he couldn't stay on the field, and when he was on the field, he wasn't right. But you look at, you know, 2021 and 2023, he's been a consistent power threat. He's hit for a relatively high average. He's gotten on base at a really good clip. He walks a ton. Last year, he walked 15.1% of the time. 
So all of that is great. Okay. Also finds the sweet spot really well. Uh, his sweet spots percent is, oh, that's always a tough one for me. Sweet spot. Try to say sweet spot three times fast. It's tough. His sweet spot percentage was 44.5 last year. So not quite, but close to half the time he was able to find the sweet spot of the bat. His barrel percentage was in the 91st percentile. His sweet spot percentage was in the 99th percentile. So he knows how to control the barrel. He is going to lift the ball. He's going to hit home runs. He's not going to strike out. He's not going to chase. Here's the problem. Last year, he still struck out almost 35% of the time. So the strikeouts alarmingly high. You know, in the previous years, he was sitting around a 27% strikeout rate. So I'd be concerned about that spike, especially because he doesn't chase. So that's, you know, him getting rung up in the zone, um, whether that's taking pitches that he shouldn't or missing, uh, you know, in the zone. Now, the other thing that concerns me a little bit when you look at Brandon Belt is in some ways you're repeating what you did last year with Daniel Vogelback and Mark Fientos. Now, you know, Daniel Vogelback uh, is still probably slower than Brandon Belt, but a 36-year-old Brandon Belt's not really moving well in the bases either. Um, Brandon Belt probably plays first base better than Daniel Vogelback and could take Pete Alonso off his feet a bit there. He did that for Vladimir Guerrero Jr. last year, but he's not really getting signed to play first base. He's getting signed to hit right-handed pitching, just like Daniel Vogelback did. And why I think Brandon Belt is a better hitter, even at his age, than Daniel Vogelback was. It's a very similar profile. It's walks, home runs is what you're hoping for. And with signing him, you are stunting the growth potential of Mark Vientos without as overwhelming of an upgrade as someone like Jorge Soler or J.D. Martinez would be. I'd be very happy if the Mets signed Brandon Belt because he would make the 2024 team a lot better. But... I would prefer that they just double up that money or I don't know how much belt's going to make. He made like 8 million last year. Is he going to get that again? I don't know. At least double, you know, maybe even more than that, that money to get a guy that's a legitimate everyday DH. That's just going to make your lineup so much better. And you worry about Mark Fiantos at another time. If it's that type of thing, fine. I I don't love the idea of just finding another platoon partner for Fiantos, even if it is a better platoon partner. Now, if it's not belt, when you look at the other DH options, there's not a lot of good ones. Carlos Santana was just signed. You know, Joey Votto's out there. That's, you know, even further into the discount bin. Ultimately, at DH, I would be happy with Belt, but I, I still think if you're going to spend there, get the big ticket items. And I just don't think the Mets are going to get the big ticket items. So maybe instead, you, you try to meet somewhere in the middle and you get someone that can maybe factor into the DH mix, but can play a position too that you need some help at. You don't need help at first base. You could need help in the outfield or in, at third base. And so that's where we're going to focus in the next two segments. We're going to start with outfielders. I got a lot of different names to go through. Before we get to that, though, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Happy Super Bowl to all who celebrate from FanDuel, America's number one sports book. If you're like me, Super Bowl Sunday is all about scoring the best seat on the couch, getting some of your favorite football snacks and placing some super bets. Whether you like to bet on every prop imaginable from you know, heads or tails on the coin toss to how long the national anthem is going to be, or if you're just trying to focus on the game, right? Maybe you're looking at the over for Patrick Mahomes passing yards or who's going to score the first touchdown. FanDuel has so many ways for you to end the season with a W or two Ws or three Ws. Not only can you bet on who will win Super Bowl 58, but FanDuel also has bets for which players will score a touchdown how many points will be scored, and so much more. New customers who join today will get $200 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Before we look at the outfielders the Mets could sign in free agency, let's discuss if there's even a need. Your opening day outfield would probably be Harrison Bader in center, Brandon Nemo on left, Sterling Marte on right. Now, there's a lot of upside in that group, but there's also plenty of downside. For one, Bader and Marte are both injury risks, coming off injury-plagued years. They also didn't really hit well last year. Bader, I don't know if he's going to hit righties. I know he'll hit lefties, 
but I really have no idea if he's going to hit righties for the Mets this year. And if he doesn't, because more of a platoon bat, you need somebody that can fill that other half of the platoon. Starling Marte, were his bad numbers last year simply due to the injuries, or is it a sign of more things to come at his age? Legitimate questions. Tyrone Taylor could solve some of them because he certainly gives you defense, and he's got plenty of power, but he doesn't hit for high average. He doesn't get on base at a good clip, and I feel a lot more comfortable with him as a fourth outfielder than a starter. DJ Stewart, I don't know if the Mets even view him as an outfielder anymore. How does David Stearns feel about him? He already said he's a bat first player. Is he comfortable putting him in left field? That I don't know. So if you add an outfielder, you want him to answer some of these questions. Defensively, you want him to be at least league average, better than DJ Stewart. And, you know, you you really, I mean, that's kind of the, the bar act. Let's just leave it at that. You want this player to be better than DJ Stewart because DJ Stewart ends up in AAA with his option. And when the Mets need another outfielder, he's the guy you call if they need some help at DH. So let's go through my options here. I got Tommy Pham, Adam Duvall, and Eddie Rosario. And we'll begin with the familiar face, Tommy Pham. We know he was great with the Mets last year. He hit 268, got on base at a 348 clip, slugged at a 472 clip, hit 10 home runs in 79 games, had a 125 WRC plus. He was 25% better than your league average hitter. The Mets traded him. He went to Arizona as part of that run to the World Series. He had his moments in that run. He did hit three home runs in the playoffs. He batted 279. He's going to play a good enough left field for you. He's certainly athletic at his age. And he proved last year he still has plenty left in the tank with his bat. Here's my issues with it. For one, he called the Mets clubhouse lazy on the way out the door. How is that received if they sign him back? It could be nothing. The players in that clubhouse could just know oh, that was Tommy being Tommy. We got no problem with him saying that we're the most unprofessional group of players I've ever played with or whatever that quote was. But it's a question. And then also, there was a reason why he was the guy I bet the jersey on last year when the Mets signed him, which is every year, just like I'm doing this year, I stake my wallet to a player that I think is going to be bad for the Mets. And if they prove me wrong, I'll buy a jersey. I still have my Tommy Fam jersey. It'd be great to wear it again. But there was a reason I was concerned because his previous history was not great offensively, and he's going to be 36 this year. Guys in their mid to late 30s don't always put up great years back to back. So I don't know. I don't know. I feel better about the sample size that Adam Duvall has put up of just consistently you know, being solid in his 30s, and he hits more home runs. I have been... You know, advocating for Adam Duvall to be a Met for years, and I'm going to keep doing it because he hits. When he's on the field, he hits. He had 21 home runs last year in 92 games. He also had a week where he was an MVP candidate. That was the first week of the season where he had five doubles, a triple, and four home runs. He was hitting 455 with an OPS over 1,500. Then, of course, like Adam Duvall typically does, he got hurt. And he missed, you know, a large stretch of the season, came back in June, had his moments. August really was his best month where he put it together for a full month, where he had nine home runs and he batted over 300. You might get a month or two like that, but that's worth it for what he's going to get paid. And obviously, he's another injury risk, but you have some of those. You throw him into the mix, and he could be awesome. He's 35 years old, another guy that, you know, you don't know how many good years he has left, but what we saw last year was still really solid. He could play all three outfield spots, although I think, at this point, you probably want to keep him in a corner to protect his health a little bit. I would love an Adam Duvall signing because he could also DH for you. You know, if Harrison Bader is hitting enough and Starlight Marte is playing a good enough outfield and he's healthy, you could, you know, put Adam Duvall out there as a DH. And you know, he's not one of these guys that only hits lefties. He has pretty much neutral splits. So if you were to get Tommy Pham, right, the Mets lineup is getting fairly righty heavy. He also is a guy that can hit both, but you look at what Duvall did last year, crushed right. He's had 18 of his 21 home runs against right-handed pitching for his career. It's pretty much, you know, an even split righty, you know, or lefty. So you don't have to worry about that. Doesn't necessarily compliment Harrison Bader in that way. He's not like another guy to put into a platoon, but again, he could be the guy that starts against righties and you could always still get Bader in there against the lefties. A guy that would compliment him in a, you know, not exact platoon because they'd be playing different positions, but in function in your lineup, a platoon would be Eddie Rosario. 
So Eddie Rosario, left-handed hitter, uh, you know, hit 21 home runs for the Braves last year. He's going to be playing left field for you if you sign him. You would then, in those instances, Eddie Rosario is your starting left fielder. Brandon Nimmo's in center. Bader maybe starts against lefties, and those two guys basically compete for playing time. I think that Eddie Rosario, to me, is not quite enough of an upgrade over DJ Stewart um, and Tyrone Taylor to a certain extent. Like Eddie Rosario's ISO last year, which is isolated power, was 195. Taylor's was 212. Now, Rosario hits for a high average, gets on base a little bit more, but it's not like he's getting on base at a 350 clip. Last year, I think it was right around 300. So he was great last season. He had some problem with his eyes the year before, which is why he struggled. He got that cleaned up and fixed, and he had a really nice year. But everybody in that Braves lineup had a good year. The Braves could have had him back in an affordable number. They chose to let him go to free agency um, and you know get Jared Kalanick instead. I'd be pretty concerned about his profile. Although, again, if the Mets signed him, I would understand why they did it because he would bring you know, more power to that outfield than – you know, pretty much anybody but Nimmo as far as home run pop. Taylor, you know, probably has a little bit more juice than him, but he's just, you know, not as experienced of a hitter. Um, and he hasn't gotten that sample size and done it the way Rosario has in the past. I, I again, would probably skew to stay away from Rosario. To me, Adam Duvall is probably the best fit of this group. Um, another name that I just wrote down was Jesse Winker as a complete bounce back candidate. I mean, I don't even know if this guy gets a major league contract. That might be a minor league deal for all we know. Uh, obviously there was that back and forth with Mets fans that Winker had that would make it a funny signing, but he's far removed from his 2021 all-star days with the Reds. His last two years have not been good. Um, I don't know if this change of scenery would do it for him. I really don't. Uh, but there was something in the tank in 2021, I guess, you know, it feels like he's far removed from it, but it is a couple of years ago. He did hit 300 that year, um, 305. He got on base at a 394 clip, and he had 24 home runs. But that was playing as a red in, in you know, Great American Ballpark, which is one of the best hitter ballparks in baseball, if not the best. Um, and he was awful last year in Milwaukee. I mean, awful. So minor league deal, I'd be okay with it. I'd be, you know, perfectly happy with any of the other three with Fam Duval or Rosario, but to me, Duval would be the best fit because I just think he's the best player of that group. Anyway, third base is still a question. We've talked about it a bunch, but I want to go through what free agent options the Mets do have there if they decide to add one more player. So we'll go into that mix in just a second. First, though, another word from our sponsors. For all of you who are everyday listeners of the show, make sure you look into becoming a Locked On Mets insider. This is our texting service where you get all the bonus coverage of the New York Mets from interesting stats, from articles I might share, and also this is where you can ask me questions anytime and where we're running our giveaways this year. So if you want your chance at some signed memorabilia, all you got to do is find the link in the episode description or go to subtext.com slash Locked On Mets. Now, let's look at third base as an option here. Do the Mets improve this position? Brett Beatty is right now your opening day starter. I don't think they're going to sign anybody that pushes him from that position. It's more about finding someone who can compliment him, maybe be a DH. That's where Justin Turner made a lot of sense. Well, guess what? He's off the board. So is there anybody else the Mets could sign that is interesting? There's really one name that jumps out, and it's a guy the Mets have showed some interest in. It's Gio Urshela. He hit 299 last year, got hurt. His OPS was just 703, didn't hit for a lot of power, still doesn't get on base at a great clip. It's not like he's walking a ton, but he does hit for a high average. He's a great glove defensively, um, and he's played in New York. He's 32 years old, so there's still plenty left in the tank. If he signed Gio Urshela, I guess the question is, is he more valuable to give a roster spot to than DJ Stewart? And I could go either way with that. I, I Personally, I don't know if he is. Because, you know, at that DH spot, you're not going to DH Urshela. You're not going to start Urshela at third and make Beatty a DH. So then you're basically, if you're signing Urshela, you're just, you have a lack of confidence in Beatty at the position um, to be your starter. 
and you're very confident that Mark Vientos can handle the DH spot without you know, having DJ Stewart on the roster potentially. So it made some sense, I guess, at one point this offseason, but the way they've gone about adding multiple outfielders into their mix, and now DJ Stewart's probably not in the outfield much, I just don't know if they would actually sign Urshela at this point. I would you know, probably verge on saying they wouldn't do that. Um, now, the funny thing is, if they had Urshela on this roster instead of Joey Wendell, I think they're better. But they already signed Joey Wendell. So you know, to have that glove first infielder, I think he's already on the roster with Wendell. Beyond that, all right, there's Whit Merrifield as an option, which would be a great signing. He would solve a ton of issues. He could be your starting second baseman. You can move Jeff McNeil into the outfield, or you could just start with Merrifield in the outfield. You could have him start at third base instead of Beatty. I mean, you probably want him in the field. I don't know why you DH him because that sort of mitigates some of its value. But uh, Whit Merrifield is a guy that it's just a good baseball player. His numbers don't jump out. Last year, he got on base at a 318 clip. Like that doesn't do a ton for you. He hit 272, he stole 26 bases. So he's going to hit for an average. He's going to steal bases. He's going to provide value on the bases with the stolen base threat and just being able to go first to third every time and score in every hit when he's in scoring position on second base. He does a lot well. He doesn't hit for a ton of power, had 11 home runs, and he nearly got 600 plate appearances. Last year, his WRC plus was below 100. So he was a below average hitter based on that metric at 93. I can't see Merrifield choosing the Mets, right? I just, I feel like he'd rather go to a different situation where he's more guaranteed playing time and, and, you know, maybe just a better situation. If he's going to be a bench guy that fills in a bunch of different places, I think he'd go to a better team. So again, I'm going through third base options and it keeps coming back to probably Brett Beatty. Here's what the Mets can do. They can sign somebody to a minor league deal. And there's two names that jump out in that boat. There's Brian Anderson. If he's at the point in his career where he's getting minor league deals, that's a really nice signing, and that's one that makes sense for this Mets team. And how you do it, you sign to a minor league deal with a fat roster bonus. And by fat, I mean a couple million dollars. But you know, a higher roster bonus than he might get with other teams. And you give him a chance to compete. And you know, a lot of Mets fans should be familiar with the name. He was with the Marlins for years. He always he looks like a really good baseball player. Um, he also had a great series against the Mets early last year with the Brewers, but the season sort of tailed off after that. He also can be put in the outfield, so he does give you that positional flexibility. He has a really strong arm. He is a good defensive player, and there was a time, you know, four years ago, where he looked like a solid hitter, but it's just been bad season after bad season after bad season. And maybe the Mets are the team that gets him and fixes him. Who knows? On a minor league deal, I would love Brian Anderson as a signing. There, there's still like enough upside to believe in, even though he's just had too many bad years in a row. And that's why I don't even think he gets a major league contract this offseason, unless it's, you know, very low money, just a guaranteed roster spot with a bad team. But we'll see what he ends up um, or where he ends up landing. The minor league signing that makes the most sense is an absolute fan favorite. Bring back Eduardo Escobar on a minor league deal. I don't know if there's a major league contract out there. For Eduardo Escobar. And you'd be basically reopening the same debate from last spring training between Beatty and Escobar. But if Brett Beatty can't win the job over Eduardo Escobar a year later, well, that says enough about where Beatty's at as a player. Because he won the job last spring training, just didn't get it right away. They eventually gave it to him. And then after having a nice little start, he really struggled. And at that point, the Mets had already traded Eduardo Escobar. But He's a great guy to just have in camp again. The players absolutely love him. And he's not ready to give up his playing days. And I think if he got to a point where he has to accept a minor league contract, I feel like he'd come back to the Mets organization. And you know, maybe you're creative with the roster bonus he gets or however you want to structure that deal. Or he's excited to come back and you know, honestly play baseball in Syracuse for most of the season. But He's an MLB veteran to have in the mix and just a good dude to bring back. And I think that's the type of signing that might happen here. I think it is probably at this stage in the offseason, minor league deals that you might see come across. Okay, this 
free agent period has moved really slowly, especially for the guys in that middle and, and lower tier. And there's going to be some MLB quality players. And I still think Eduardo Escobar, to some respects, is still a major leaguer. But when you get to this age after a season that he just had, major league offers dry up. And those are the players the Mets are probably going to sign at this point. I think the best uh, you know, player that could be brought in is that the Mets do shock us all at the DH market and, and they grab a Soler and Martinez, but I would not count on it. I think Brandon Belt is more likely because the price tag's a little bit less, but even then I wouldn't count on that. Maybe there is an outfielder. I could see Adam Duvall as, or, or somebody of that ilk, one of those, those outfielders I mentioned where the Mets just say, you know what, let's bring somebody else in the mix and let's sort of make DJ Stewart beat him for a job. Um, and again, in the infield, I, I could see them, you know, probably skewing more towards minor league guys, but maybe they do say, you know what, let's just bring Elvis Andres in the mix too. And, and, and have another guy that could play third. And, you know, if we have to cut somebody, um, you know, and make a tough decision by opening day, we, we do it, but let's just bring some talent into the mix. I don't know. Ultimately the Mets are likely done, but there's enough in this market that I think they're still on the phones right now is I guess where I'm at with all of this. Anyway, that's going to be all for today's edition of Locked on Mets. Uh, make sure you follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. If you're listening, if you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, trying to make a push to 8,000 subs. So appreciate all of you who subscribe. Uh, if you want to become a Locked on Mets insider, you can find the link in the episode description. Follow me on Twitter at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked on Mets. If you want to check out the first ever 24-7 streaming channel covering everything in the world of sports on YouTube, you can do so with Locked On Sports Today with our local experts from each team and our league-wide experts from each league. Locked On Sports Today is streaming 24-7 on YouTube.